Coming up on today's episode, how to choose the perfect set-top box for you, aspect ratio hell, and avoiding it, is the PS3 d HDTV compatible? A little bit more news from CES and the Blu-ray releases for the week of January 19th, 2010. This is HD Nation. This episode of HD Nation is brought to you by Squarespace, Netflix, and GoDaddy.com. Welcome to HD Nation. I'm Robert Heron. And I'm Patrick Norton. HD Nation is your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. Blu-ray, online, satellite, cable, if it's in HD, we like it. Should we, should we just finish up with it? Should we start ranting about what we've been watching, or should we fire up the last of the CES news? I'm good with either one, because I've been busy on both fronts. Oh, I lost a quarter. I guess we start with the CES news. <laughs> Not a lot of OLED. No. Uh, there were two things on display, though. One, Sony was showing off probably what would be a 2011 product. 3D OLED, TV, OLED TVs, that's organic light-emitting diode. Not LED, it's OLED. And those ultra-thin emissive displays, they were showing, I, I forget the sizes off the top of my head. I want to say it was about a 20-inch panel, 20. 23 inch panel. That's ginormous for OLED. But they were, yes, very much so. Compared to the 11 inch model you can currently buy from Sony. Or the three inch one. These were being demonstrated afford. with 3D technology running PlayStation games and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that looked pretty neat. But over at the LG booth, they had a 15 inch model. I want to say it's the EL, EL or LE? Oh, the EL 9500. One? Yes. Water resistant, <laughs> 15 inch display. And it is, of course, it has no pricing or availability. They're claiming probably a fall launch for this product, okay. so we will finally have a successor to Sony's Just OLED in time for TV. people in Arizona and Southern California with pools to the, purchase The big one. advantage for OLED really is the performance of the pixels. It right. has like the speed of a plasma, yet the thinness of an LCD, or actually thinner, and it's very, very bright. And the black is very, very dark, so you have super contrast. Well, also in theory, if they get it to scale up, it should also be cheaper than an LED to produce. I, I, in theory. In theory. That theory has not held up whatsoever so far, though. <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> hey, did we mention Vizio beyond my horrible misinformation that Vizio is doing a $3,500, 75-inch 3D-ready HDTV this well, summer? Well, I think I said it was 73 inches, so I wasn't, I wasn't much better. It's 72, 72. inches, yes. <laughs> six feet! Yeah, <laughs> awesome. A nice, even six feet. LED backlit with wireless, including 802.11n, Bluetooth, 3500 bucks, and they're saying they're going to have this out in August. And that is going to be a huge, that, that's just a terrific price point. Yeah. And a giant size screen. One of the biggest you'll be able to buy this year. Hey, like we said, that's, that's like the final nail in the coffin of rear projector DLPs. You were thinking, too, not that long ago, the 70-inch big screen right. LCDs were $20,000. This year, I think they're still $20,000 from the other manufacturers. So seeing 72 inches at that price point, mm -hmm. that's just... That's going to get a lot of people excited. In theory, it could look absolutely awful. They could have the cheapest glass in the world, but I'm doubting it because right now, Vizio, number one seller of HCTVs in North America, and they're claiming they can get the best glass out there. So this is going to be, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about yeah, it. Yeah, with LED backlighting, oh always good. The <laughs> other display they had in this suite at the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, it wasn't on the show floor itself, but what a suite it was. They had a 58-inch Razer LED 21 by 9 cinema display. Wow. Wide, widescreen. Now, now, the good folks at Philips had introduced a display similar to this in Europe last year. <laughs> uh, apparently, they might be bringing that to America. Who knows? Anyway, Vizio's going to have it. Is this all so you can run your applications on one side of the screen and have the football game on the other? Or something? I really hope so. Yes, definitely <laughs> that. It will have all of their Vizio internet applications via right. uh, available on the set as well. But the big thing is that the aspect ratio. Mm -hmm. 21 by 9 comes very close to what you see in the movie theater. Uh, uh, basically about a 235 right. to 240 to 1 aspect ratio. Which means the shape no, of the picture. no letterboxing top and bottom. No, and they demonstrated <laughs> this with a couple of animated titles. Mm -hmm. Basically, it would detect the black bars and then scale it to fit perfectly. So if you right. hate black bars, think about a 21 by 9 display, and that'll be coming up later this year as well. I think that one's going to be expensive even for Vizio. Nah. <laughs> 58, you know, think about that, 58 inch though. With that aspect ratio, keep that in mind. It's it's not as rectangular or squarish right. as a 16 by 9 display. It's much wider. So 
They're also, I should say, doing something a lot of other vendors are doing, which is basically killing off everything but LED backlighting. Yeah. Is that for Energy Star compliance? No, it's more for the ROSE, ROHS compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, they are very anti-lead. And with all of your fluorescent lighting systems, you use a little bit of lead, or lead, excuse me, mercury. And <laughs> <laughs> ah, forgive the head cold I have. But uh, getting rid of the mercury and getting rid of mercury-based lamps out of Got any it. projection system or display system for that matter. So moving to LED gets rid of that. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, and in my opinion, it's a better quality light, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. You can achieve using LEDs compared to fluorescent tubes, so you get better color quality out of these sets as well. These are both good things. Yeah. And they've got a wireless HDMI adapter. Yes! All of the XVT panels that Vizio is going to be selling this year, the 2010 models, mm -hmm. have incorporated wireless HD streaming using the 60 gigahertz technology. I believe it's Psybeams. They now have a four-port HDMI transmitter Basically, you can plug four devices into it, transmits wirely, wirelessly to the supporting Vizio oh, TVs be. or any TV that supports the Psybeam technology, but it doesn't come with the receiver, considering the receivers are built into the Vizio TVs. Anyway, 250 bucks, and that is by far the cheapest I've seen for an announced product in the wireless space. How, how, any idea what kind of range we're talking about here? Uh, 30 feet solid, even through wow. a wall, I would say. And you could probably, I would say you could probably double that under ideal circumstances, like line of sight in a big room or something like that. So an IR blaster underneath the television, my wireless HDMI, and I can stuff everything else in the closet. Yeah, you won't even need the IR blaster for the, wow. for the Vizio TVs, because they all have Bluetooth. And they also oh. showed off some great headphones, Bluetooth enabling one, wireless controllers using that technology, right. but also your standard Bluetooth headphones. So if you want to watch the TV in a room and turn the volume down, yet still enjoy it and not disturb anyone, boom. I'll sold. reserve my judgment until they hear them, because I, oh. I, because Bluetooth audio usually sounds very compressed and very awful. But i got to say, in my current living environment, where the kids next to the HDTV, it would be awesome to be able to do... You know, a, a, a really simple, convenient, and wireless headphones off of the HGTV. That, that would be awesome. That would be convenient. That would be nice. Optoma, the projector people, have a new line of 3D-ready projectors designed for gaming from the ground up. Designed for gaming. I love that. The game time models are shipping first quarter, and they're cheap. 500 bucks for the GT360, 700 bucks for the GT720. Short throw lenses for small rooms, 2,500 lumens, which is pretty solid. The GT360 is basically designed for the Wii. It's 800 by 600. And the GT720 is 1280 by 800. So they're basically talking 720p-ish resolutions. And they both include, and I think this is the gaming part, not long, they include a remote, which is kind of obvious, but they include a backpack. <laughs> for transportation. For transportation. Actually, the last Optima projector I picked up came with its own travel case. Mm -hmm. So I think a backpack would just make it a little more... I don't know, useful. I like that thought. So yeah. we should also point out that Optoma announced another 3D ready projector, 720p, the AC home theater projector. It's going to cost $700. It's the HD66. So 1080p still costs $1,000, at but least for quality Optoma. gets better. I need a new projector. I also I have to mention, too, LG showed off a 3D projector as well. Six chip, basically two light paths using two separate lamps. Uh, six chips to do each color processing. Is that for 3D without the glasses? No, no. Oh, 3D okay. with the glasses, but, and then it projects all of that through the single lens system. So you end up mm -hmm. with both images being projected through that one lens system. That got a lot of oohs and ahs I saw from the crowd for the, for the non-TV right. 3D systems. Get your movie and your yeah. sports on. On the more high end, Denon introduced the S-B5D, or to be the S-5BD. It's an integrated profile 2.0 Blu-ray player and 5.1 channel receiver, $1,800, and Macintosh. Those are the people with the 60s style faces on all their incredibly expensive high end gear. Sounds gorgeous, not cheap though. They introduced their very first Blu-ray player. Aww. Aww. I know there's a lot of audio, audio <laughs> files out there who really enjoy their products. Check the lower third for the price on that one because I just, I just <laughs> didn't want to say it. <gasps> Should we take a moment to thank one of our sponsors? Yes, indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Netflix. If you get movies delivered to your house or stream them online, they got like 90,000 titles you can have shipped to your home, including a ton of Blu-ray titles, a lot more than I can find anywhere near my house, like the movie Nine, based on the award-winning short film about a ragdoll's attempt to save his kind from oblivion. This film features an amazing voice cast, including Elijah Wood, Jennifer Connelly, John C. Riley, and Martin Landau. You should definitely put nine in your Blu-ray Netflix queue today. Free shipping both ways to and from your home. Over 40 shipping centers means deliveries happen in just a single business day in most cases. It's totally convenient. Plans start at $4.99 a month. As a new member, you can get a no-risk two-week free trial membership. Just go to www.netflix.com slash HDNation and remember to type the www when you use that URL. 
And hey, if you're looking for a great way to use Netflix's watch instantly, get a Roku box. It is the easiest way to watch Netflix movies, Revision 3 shows, and a lot more. Connected to your TV, connected to the internet, you're done. No fussing around with your computer. Starts at 80 bucks. It's Netflix members' top-rated streaming player. Go to revision3.com slash Roku. You can try one risk-free for 30 days. If you don't like it, send it back. No cost to you. Believe us, you will not be disappointed. Normally, this is the part of the show where we get our top five list on, but Patrick was watching Moulin Rouge last night and became completely unhinged over aspect ratios. I love this movie, right? I own the DVD. I saw it in the movie theater. Actually, the movie theater where our, uh, our beloved producer, Serafina, works. It is a gorgeous, visually stunning film, and I'm watching it on Cinemax, and it looks wrong. It looks really wrong. Why? Because the aspect ratio is screwed up. I mean, one of the interesting bits of information you can glean from IMDb.com, amongst other places, is information on the movie's original aspect ratio. Essentially, the aspect ratio of an image is its width divided by its height, and it is the sort of the native resolution of a film. Your ACTV is 16 by 9, that's 16 colon 9. It can also be expressed 1.78 to 1. Your old standard, def standard definition TVs, standard def TVs, NTSC is 4 by 3. By 3, which is like 1.33 to 1? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, 4, 3. Much like the original film, <laughs> 35 millimeter film, I believe, too. Yeah, well, so a, a 2.35 to 1 movie or 2.35, 2.40. Cinemascope is compared, Cinemascope is. Right what they shoot things in usually for film uh, film right. productions, 235 to 1 to 240 to right. 1. Anything in between there is considered cinema. Moulin Rouge Scope. shot 235 to 1. It fits in your 16 by 9 screen, but it's letterbox. Basically, horizontal mats are placed above and below the image. Those are the black bars. If you're talking about standard F 4.3, vertical mats called pillar boxes fill in the unused space, in the, or the unused space, I should say, on the left and right of the screen. On Cinemax, Moulin Rouge filled the 16 by 9 screen. Yay! Cinemax, uh, HBO, no? a lot of other places do this. No, actually, this is a big <laughs> no-yay. They do this so people don't call up and say, why do I have black bar? You're, this is supposed to be the HD TV. Why do I have a big black bar here? <laughs> so what they do, right, they use a, a modified aspect ratio. They zoom into it to fill the vertical space of the screen, and they crop the left and the right sides of the frame. So all this amazing detail that's going on the left and the right side of the screen, gone. Unless yeah. they do a pan and scan, which basically means moving around where you kind of have the center oh. of the frame. That, that was popular with 4 by 3 yeah. content. When you took a movie and you wanted to fill the screen on your old TV, <sighs> they did this thing called pan and scan, which is essentially you're leaving it up to whoever yeah. does that edit to pick what part of the scene you're going to look at. Yeah, so zooming and cropping slightly better than, say, just simply stretching standard def to fill an HDTV 16 by 9 screen, which gives you the big fat round oompa loompa people, but it still looks wrong and you're losing a lot of the content content, a lot of the information that was on the original movie. And I gotta say, no matter how much you hate black bars in, yeah, window boxing where a widescreen movie shows up on a standard def channel, you ever seen this? Where it's like, there's this skinny bit of movie in the in the middle and black bars here and then the big pillars the zoom on either button side. is great for that. Oh, so oh. that's like, yeah, window boxing is the worst, but, but look, that's the way the content is supposed to be displayed so you see all of the original information on the screen. That's displayed properly, or as properly as you can get on your gear at home. Matter of fact, the, the, this whole concept of 16 by 9, 16 by 9 was a very specific choice made back in the 80s by the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. They're called SIMPTI usually. A guy by the name of Dr. Kearns H. Powers. He, he basically cut out a stack of cardboard rectangles yeah. in all of the popular ratios, NTSC 4.3, 185 to 1, 220 to 1, which is like 70 millimeter in Panavision, 235 to 1 Cinemascope. And he figured out they will all fit in a rectangle with a 16 by 9 ratio. And it's that, a compromise. It was a compromise. You know, and the deal was like there's gonna be black bars here, black bars here, they're gonna be different sizes, but everything can actually just be displayed in its proper ratio. Nowadays, totally. of course, a lot of television is being shot in 185 to 1, which is essentially your 16 by a little bit wider than 16 by 9. Actually, the hurt really locker, thin black bars. Yeah. Almost unnoticeable usually. Yeah, extremely difficult. And a lot of stuff's actually being shot, especially for television, in 16 by 9. Yeah, if you, if you want to have your, your mind completely blown, look up Open Mat on Wikipedia or something, where they talk about essentially shooting 35 millimeter film, and the cinematographer has to frame the, every shot so it'll work both in a 4 by 3 and a like 235 or 16 by 9 scan. It's painful. I can't imagine what it's like to try to shoot that. Anyhow, look, do me a favor. Don't oompa loompa people. Don't <laughs> zoom in if you don't have to. Enjoy the black bars through there so the content looks the way it's supposed to. I want everything to be out on Blu-ray. I know. Now. Me too. Speaking of which, Mr. Hammer, would you like to do the Blu-ray releases for the week of January 19th, 2010? I would. 
First up, we have the whole Bourne trilogy. Matt Damon stars in The Bourne Identity, The Bourne Supremacy, and The Bourne Ultimatum, all released on Blu-ray this week. Now, they had been available in a box set, but now you can buy them one at a time for Ooh. more born goodness. <laughs> and it must be a good week for series because we also have the re release of both Smoke and Aces and its straight-to-disc sequel, Smoke and Aces 2 Assassin's Ball. Next, we have Che. It's the Criterion Collection's version of Steven Soderbergh's two-part film, released as one four-hour epic, starring Benicio Del Toro, covering Che Guevara's part in the Cuban Revolution and his subsequent involvement in Bolivia. And for something not quite so heavy, find out what would happen if only one man in the world knew how to lie. It's Ricky Gervais in The Invention of Lying. Then pick up Boogie Nights and follow Mark Wahlberg as he portrays Dirk Diggler making his way through the porn biz in the 70s and 80s. Other releases this week include According to Greta, Across the Hall, Gamer, Magnolia, Pandorum, Weeds Season 5, and we announced this one last week, but its release has been pushed to this week. Kate Beckinsale's thriller, Whiteout. Coming up next, choosing the best set top box for you. Right now though, we want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace. You can now manage your entire Squarespace website on the go with the new Squarespace iPhone application. Post and edit entries, manage content, save drafts, post photos, and more, all directly from your iPhone. The app has a completely custom user interface that matches your Squarespace site's look and feel 100%. It's also the only iPhone application on any major publishing platform that contains an iPhone native statistics interface that tightly integrates your phone, your site, and your data. Got more than one website? No problem. Just use the Accounts tab and you can manage content for multiple Squarespace sites. You can save a draft post for one site and then easily jump to another site to schedule a post for later in the day. So even if you're not at your desk, you can still keep your website up to date if you've got your iPhone. And if you're just starting out with Squarespace, be sure to use the code HDNATION when you check out. You'll get 10% off for the lifetime of your order. Check it all out at squarespace.com. Bargain price set-top boxes were a big theme at CES, yeah. right? The Boxy Box by D-Link, Popcorn Hour's got some new stuff, or I was going to say Siabas, who makes the Popcorn Hour, and there's a new Popcorn Hour. We're going to talk about that later. Anyhow, Mikey Michigan, question about set-top boxes. He asked, with so many choices of set-top boxes, like Boxy, Roku, or the Apple TV, I'm wondering if I can get the best of all worlds by using a Mac Mini attached to an AC TV, or does it have its own limitations? I'm thinking of picking up a Mac, using a wireless mouse and keyboard, hooking the whole thing up to my 46-inch Sony, using a DVI to HDMI adapter and a separate USB audio adapter. Is this the way to go? Love the show. I watch it religiously. Mike in Michigan. Thank you, Mike. Kind words, man. I gotta say, I have used a Mac Mini as a set-top box for DVDs and downloaded content, but you are not getting a lot for 600 bucks. That's the entry-level price for a Mac Mini these days. Matter of fact, you don't even get an Apple remote in the box anymore. And there's no Blu-ray playback on OS X unless you would have, well, actually, there's no Blu-ray play playback on OS X, period. You're going to run Windows on it to get OS X. Running Boxy on it can be pretty sweet. There's no iTunes DRM content, but the interface is nifty. If you haven't seen it, Boxy 2.0, basically the new interface, was made available last week. Roku, Boxy Box, Apple TV, Popcox, Popcorn Hour. Uh, there's just a long list of boxes out yeah, there. Yeah, we even looked at the WD uh, TV Live yes. last week or two, a couple weeks ago. So let's talk about, okay, the Roku. It's great basically for streaming content. There's no local content version of that available. There's no hard drive on that one, so it definitely needs a, a network connection. Great for Netflix. Great for getting your Revision 3 content on Twitch and a lot of other online video sources. 80 bucks? 80 bucks for the SD version, 100 bucks for the HD version. So the, gotcha. the SD version starts at 80, the, the full version is 100 bucks. Uh, Boxy Box by D-Link out later this year. Um, it's using the new Tegra 2 chipset from uh, NVIDIA. NVIDIA, right? That's where basically this little tiny triangular box with this really slick RF remote control on that one. It's built around the Boxy Box. Also, is going to support Netflix. Other than Netflix, I'm not sure what's available right now. I, gotta, I haven't I haven't really looked at the other paid content, but it's a great way to get all the, your local content off of your network and a lot of streaming online content like Pandora and stuff into the box. Aggregating, but also the social media aspect right. of it as well. Boxy does that really well. If you're into sharing what you're watching at any given moment with a group of friends, mm -hmm. that might be something to consider. Boxy software or the dedicated hardware at the new Boxy box. Right, but you know, Roku, not so good for your local content. I own on my server in my house. Boxy box should do that. Apple TV will also do that, but Apple TV will not support Netflix or basically any 
TV paid service other than Apple TV. And I gotta say right now, after downloading like The Hurt Locker, I've been waiting for this movie forever. I couldn't get into Best Buy. I went to Apple TV, I went to iTunes, it's there. I got the HD version and it looks like ass because oh. it's over compressed. That's my biggest complaint. <laughs> I, I love PC-based solutions. Right. If you could do it with an Apple product, that'd be great. But if you can build a home theater PC around a Windows platform, you have a real browser. So anything that's web-based, boom, you're able to use that at, right, right out of the box right. or as soon as you want or anytime you want. Also, you can add things like a Blu-ray player mm -hmm. to it. And you have a variety of different interfaces to yeah. choose from. You could go with Boxy Software for free or you could use any of the paid options that are out there. Windows Media Center is going to come Windows with, Media with Windows Center 7. As well. I, there's there's some pretty good. If you guys are interested, we can talk about some of the options available. Dell's got some pretty good stuff out there, and I also got to say the the Pop Box, which is coming out, should be 130 bucks, which will do streaming content from your local your your local draw your local uh, you know network server. It'll also do you know services like Netflix. Um, Popcorn Hour, same thing, except it adds in a hard drive. And we all thought Popbox, Siabas, who ro basically runs Popcorn Hour, the C200 just came out. The, the A200 NMT is coming out later this year. Smaller, sleeker, injection molded plastic, still has the ability to hold a hard drive with content locally. And it's not going to, basically the Popbox and the uh, Popcorn Hour will still keep going for both Siabas. The, the Popbox basically network-based set-top device, very similar to the Roku in some ways. I just want a tiny box, really. Uh, something that can mimic what I do on my notebook, a full PC, mm -hmm. yet uh, maybe a little bit more compact than that. And I like the idea of using wireless, either a keyboard and mouse controller mm -hmm. or something that lets you just do the interface on screen without wires or cords or anything like that. Yeah, that's that's, gonna that's be... really going to be key for me. I think it's time we build yeah. something and it, show it off. It may, be the last, it may be the last home theater PC we ever build, right? It, because it, also, it with some of the stuff we were seeing, the, the cable cards uh, devices that were available at CES were pretty interesting. So we will build a home theater PC uh, for you. I'm, I'm just, I'm not feeling the Mac Mini, right? If you already own one, great, attach it to that, that Sony. But also, no HDMI out means basically you have to handle the audio separately from the HDMI. It's just, it's 600 bucks plus 50 bucks for remote control. I'm just not feeling that. We can do this. We can do this. Yeah. All right. Well, so you send this email. We'll start putting together the spec. You tell us what you want our, our, our home theater PC. 1080p right Blu ray, <laughs> Wi Fi. <laughs> Hey, before we go on, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, GoDaddy.com. Web hosting from GoDaddy.com includes 99.9% .9 uptime, 24-7 support, and free access to GoDaddy's hosting connection. It's the place for GoDaddy users to install over 30 free applications designed to help you get the most from your GoDaddy hosting plan and website. Plus, use the code HDN14 to get a .biz domain name for only $7.49. And once you've registered your .biz domain, head over to my.biz to enter for a chance to win $25,000. That's right, one lucky Revision 3 viewer will win $25,000. Believe me when I say your chances to win are incredibly high, but the contest ends soon. So go to my.biz to enter now. Ken writes in, in episode 25, you say there are no full-length feature films done in IMAX because of the cost and amount of film required. But in episode 26, you say, Avatar is an IMAX 3D. What's the deal? I know, I know this one. What is the answer? Uh, it's IMAX DMR, Ken. Avatar wasn't shot in, in IMAX with the big fat IMAX cameras with like the two minute reels. It was digitally remastered into IMAX 3D for display in IMAX theaters. Just like Beauty and the Beast, Apollo 13, Star Wars Episode Two, The Matrix Reloaded, The Matrix Revolutions, 300, V for Vendetta, you do 3D, blah, blah, blah. Basically like pretty much not Most. all, but almost every feature movie you see in IMAX was almost entirely shot in regular 35 millimeter. It's really interesting, right? So, you know, like the Jonas Brothers, the 3D concert experience. I mean, later this year, Alice in Wonderland, Toy Story 3, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, Tron Legacy, amongst others. Uh, almost all those are going to be in 3D. That's like the big buzzword, IMAX 3D. Oh, yeah. None of them were shot in IMAX. All of them essentially going through some fancy up conversion using IMAX DMR that I, and I quote, digitally enhances the image quality of 35 millimeter motion pictures for projection onto screens up to eight stories high. The images are just as big, clear, and beautiful as those films originally produced in the 15 slash 70 millimeter format. I don't know if I buy that because if they could just shoot 35 millimeter and scale it up, they wouldn't have all those expensive cameras and shoot all of that expensive film. And I really want to go back in time and see The Dark Knight in, uh, in, in IMAX so I can see, because basically parts of The Dark Knight and parts of the, the last Transformers movie were shot in IMAX. That's one of those weird moments when it goes from like the letterboxes. Remember the letterboxes we talked about and the aspect ratio thing? When The Dark Knight goes from like 
as letterbox to full screen, that's the, the IMAX parts they shot where everything seems more alive and delicious and tasty and all the details in there. That's the IMAX stuff. So I don't, I don't really buy into it that the Dark Knight parts that were shot in 35 millimeter looked as amazing as the IMAX sections. But basically, Ken, nothing. None of the, okay, parts of a couple four feature length movies have been shot in IMAX. Yeah. But, but it's all basically, it's, it's upscale. They use a really fancy upscaler at the IMAX factory. <laughs> Extra sharpening. Just Extra turn it up to 10 or yeah. 11. So yeah. everyone has a halo. It's all about halos. So most IMAX really is <laughs> IMAX. It's upconverted. Yeah. Okay. IMAX feature movies. The stuff that comes from IMAX where it's like, you know, IMAX volcanoes of the undersea, IMAX, we go someplace dangerous you can't get to with a really cool camera. That stuff's all shot in IMAX and it really looks amazing on an IMAX screen. Not that the, the feature, like, I mean, Dark Knight probably looked amazing, but I'm just saying the 35 millimeter parts probably, while we're talking about 3D, <laughs> Otto writes in, at the end of the last show, you told us that you need HDMI 1.4 to have 3D HD on your TV. Now the PS3 will get an update for games and movies to show 3D, but it still only has a standard HDMI 1.3 cable interface. How? How are they going to solve this, Otto? Yes. Okay, Robert, how are they going to solve this? It, it turns out, <laughs> and this is according to the HDMI work group, that any HDMI implementation doesn't need to implement all parts of it. You can only you can do whatever part you want if you're creating this port. And like I tell most people, wait, wait. So as long as you have part of the HDMI spec enabled in your port, you get the HDMI label on your box. Yeah. This would explain a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Inconsistencies and things like that. Anyway, for the PlayStation 3, there will be a firmware update coming out later this year that will enable the PlayStation 3 to do the heavy lifting required for. 3D HDTV output. Now, flaming I cell processor. I heard some processor. initial rumors that this would only work with certain Bravia TVs. My official word from my rep at Sony says absolutely not. The PS3, wow. once it's updated, will work with any of the upcoming 3D HDTVs. And, and it's still a great video game player. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> and, a, and a good disc player. And I stream my Netflix movies that way too. And it looks great. But uh, no, you won't need anything special other than that firmware update and a capable TV. Right. The question will be, do you need a new cable, like an HDMI 1.4 cable? I have a feeling any HDMI cable will work yeah. for this. And we shall spoil you will, even with the PS3, you will still need the goggles oh, yeah. to see 3D HDTV. You will need your glasses. But for the Blu-ray content coming out, if you already have the PS3, you're, you're about halfway there. You just need to get that TV set rolling. Mm. And yeah, so no, no on needing a Bravia TV to make it work. And yes, the PS3 will do it. It's simply implementing it in software in its in its internal guts to then split spit Squeak that signal it over out, the one three cable. Get it over the one three cable, right? Or, the or the one four cable. Oh, the one three port on the back of the yeah. PS3. Because technically, the ports are all. Because see, for the three D part, you really don't need a new cable for that. Yeah. As far as HDMI goes, it's more for other features of HDMI four, which have yet to be used anywhere yet. <laughs> Namely, Ethernet in HDMI, the twisted pair. That that would require a different cable, but. We haven't even seen a TV yet implement those features yet. So, for the 3D stuff, and you got a PS3, you're better off than most folks. The so. PS3, the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Byte Jacker, you never heard of it? Oh my goodness, it's your guide to independent and downloadable games. They have a couple of great episodes from the Blip Festival. If you dig music made for video games and old game consoles, you will not want to miss these episodes. They've got interviews and performances from all the chiptune greats, as well as interviews with the leading downloadable game developers like Gaijan Games, creators of the Bit.Trip series of WiiWare games, and Adam Saltzman, creators of Cannabalt, one of last year's massive hits on the iPhone. Their first episode from the Blip Festival came out last week, and they've got another one this week, so be sure to head to revision3.com slash bitejacker and check out all the Blip Festival action. It's good stuff. Hey, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode of HD Nation. <laughs> As always, we want to know what you think, so send your comments, questions, or suggestions to hdnation at revision3.com. Especially if you want us to basically take in your needs on our HD, our home theater PC buildup. You can also hang out, by the way, with the other viewers in HD Nation forums at revision3.com slash forum, and you can find all the links to stuff we talked about in the show at the website, hdnation.tv. That's right. You also <laughs> find all the links to subscribe to the show. So if you're not getting the latest episode of HD Nation delivered to your door, what are you waiting for? Well, you could just be pressing the button on the Roku. I've got my TiVo season pass set up. I like that yeah. thought. That's it, people. Subscribe, watch, tell your friends about it, please. Until next time. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm Robert Herring. And I'm Patrick Norton. We'll see you next week.